you are about to listen to a Jason Burgos exclusive interview. Good, man. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. How, how, how are you feeling? I've talked to a couple of people that are in the finals now. And, and are, are you, is there euphoria still for being in the finals? Or are you fully in fight mode, getting ready for your finals and over the uh, success you had in the playoffs? Yeah, it's kind of just back to normal life and back to camp mode and, um, you know, being ready for the, the next thing ahead because, you know, being a finalist doesn't really mean as much as being the champ of the first season. And um, you could get all the way to this far and winning, winning those four fights this year. But to me, it really doesn't mean anything until I finish this, you know, finish the job in a way because, uh, Styler is a tough dude and he's a scrappy dude. And regardless of how he got to the finals or what transpired during his fight in the semis, I mean, he's still a tough opponent. Uh, you know, he, I'm glad you mentioned Styler. I mean, he, he had a very successful yet odd undefeated run in this season of the PFL. I mean, you know, you mentioned that you, you thought he, he's scrappy. I mean, what on some other levels? What do you, how do you think he looked in the season overall? And, and also, do you feel there was maybe some luck had some part in his run when he faces you on, on New Year's Eve? Oh, I definitely think he had some luck, but I think everybody had to have a little luck to get to the finals. Um, no matter who you are or what weight class you are, because I I always talk about this with wrestling for the NCAA tournament every year. I mean, there's you look at the, the guys who place in the top eight or even, you know, guys who don't place, there literally could be a match away from winning the tournament at any point of the entire tournament. And some of those weight classes, if you wrestled that tournament three weekends in a row, you could have three different champions. And so I kind of look at it like that. Like, you, there's got to be some luck involved. There's got to be some things that go your way. Um when it comes down to the way the bracket's set up, I mean, just everything that went along with it. I mean, he had two first round finishes coming into it, put him in the top seed, uh, you know, the side of the bracket, you know, that you could go on and on about the way things went for his side and could have gone on and on the way things went for my side. I had a great quarters and semis, uh, um, you know, the way that the way that the fight transpired on my end went very well. I, I had a great first and second fight in the regular season. Um, you know, I think it just comes down to the way things go sometimes or just, you know, you you can make your own luck to a certain extent, but destiny is never going to, uh, it's never going to let that person, you know, get away with things. It's always going to go the way it's supposed to go. Now, I, I interviewed Siler before the playoffs as well, and we talked about how his striking has come along under the tutelage of Mark Montoya, and now he is more well-rounded. He, he's the best version of himself yet. Is he better than the man you beat last year, and, and do you have to do anything different this time around to get the same result? Um, I believe that he's better than he was last year because he changed teams and is learning again, and I believe I'm better than I was last year because I changed teams also. And uh, working with new coaches and a new team and a new group of teammates and better partners, or not necessarily better partners because it's hard to ask for better partners than what I had at Alpha Male, but just different partners and uh, fresh looks. And I think it's given me the ability to kind of relearn a little bit and go back to the drawing board and do things a little differently and um I feel like a younger fighter than I was when I left Team Alpha Male. And uh, to me, that's just scary because I already felt like I was at such a high level when I left there. And to come through this whole season and get those four wins and have, you know, the two finishes that I had and just kind of the way that I got these things done and the way that I, I got to go in there and, and avenge that loss to Harrison in the semis and, um, you know, just make that fight go my way. No matter what he did in that fight, it didn't matter. I made that fight go my way. And uh, to me, that that showed a lot of change that happened in the t last year and a half, aside from when I broke my hand the first time I fought him. 
I definitely want to get to Andre Harris, and I have a couple questions on that. But before that, um, what is the, the gym you're currently training at now? And, like, how long have you been there? And also, adding on to that, I, I talked to Saad Awad in Bellator a couple, like, a month or so ago. And he talked about it's, as a professional, you kind of maybe need to change camps. It helps growth, and it helps you you become a, a better fighter. You kind of mentioned that yourself. You know, do you agree with that? Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. I think, I think obviously loyalty to a team and to people is is one thing but it's got to go both ways you know you got to have those people working for you and trying to better you as well it just can't be oh he's not loyal to the team and he left because of this it's if the team isn't being loyal to you and if they're not helping you improve there's no reason to stay there to your demise Mm. and that was a reason that I felt that I had to move on and kind of and kind of reinvent myself a little bit and just learn from different people. And I'm not going to say that where I'm at is better. It's just different. I mean, I love all the guys at Alpha Male, and I spent seven years there. But, uh, you know, I've spent the last eight months with the guys at Extreme Couture, mm. the UFC Performance Institute, uh, 10th Planet Jiu-Jitsu Las Vegas. All the people that I've come across and trained with over the last eight months have all made me better. I've made them better. I've just had a lot of fun this year, and I I felt kind of refreshed and rejuvenated as a fighter and as a person. I mean, since so since you did leave and you had you know wonders and questions about the loyalty. I mean, how do you feel about the whole thing with the Cody Garbrandt and TJ Dillashaw? Do you everybody seems very from Alpha Male very loyal to Cody because he's there? But do you maybe feel for TJ Dillashaw a little bit? Is this story much more? It's more. TJ side, there is some some truth to what he's saying compared to just everybody favoring Car- Cody Garber in a way. Yeah, I don't think I think Cody kind of got thrown in the middle of it. It was more between Faber and uh, and TJ and and Cody was just the active fighter that was at the weight class and she kind of got thrown into that situation and turned it into a rivalry more than anything. But mm-hmm. you know it, that was. You know, that was about three years ago, the, the whole thing with TJ, or two or three, I can't even remember now. But that that whole scenario is, you know, it was, to me, it was squashed back then, but I guess they had to go through that whole ultimate fighter against each other, and then the two fights, and mm-hmm. things like that. But I've been friends with both of those guys for a long time, and I didn't choose a side for, each, for either of those guys, or for either team, or whatever it may be, because... In, in the back of my mind, I'm still friends with both of those guys, and I, I talk to TJ here and there. I work with Cody's uncle when I'm back in Ohio before I go back for my camps in, in Vegas. Um, there's no, to me, there's no, you know, love lost between those two, and I doubt they'll ever be friends. And I would say that I would doubt that Faber and TJ would ever be friends also, mm-hmm. but you know, it's it's gone, it's put in the past now, and, you know, if either of them, like, TJ doesn't care either way. He never wanted a grudge, or he never held a grudge against anybody at Alpha Male. It was more one-sided than anything, but, um, you know, I think it'd be stupid for people to, to have any anger toward each other, and they don't have to be friends, but I think it's something that, that they could put behind them now. They've, Cody and TJ have fought twice. And, you know, everybody knows the results of those fights and, uh, and, you know, whatever it is or whatever it was, I think it was kind of stupid to an extent because I, I understand loyalty, but I understand wanting to be the best in the world and wanting to go where you need to go to get mm-hmm. the partners or coaches you need. And so I agreed with that part of it. So that's why I was kind of split between the two and I, I didn't take sides, but I've known Cody since he was 13 wrestling in Ohio on the same teams as my younger brother. Mm -hmm. And I knew TJ since I went to Team Alpha Male in 2011. So I knew both of those guys for a long time, and I think both of them knew and respected that I wasn't going to kind of team up or side with either of them. But, um, you know, I I consider myself good friends with both of them, and I never would talk to one and then talk to the other about the other. It was was more just I had separate friendships with both of them, and it continues to be that way. Now, I interviewed Andre Harrison a couple times, and I interviewed him before the playoffs, and I brought up the topic of fighting you possibly in the semis and how it would be a very difficult fight in the semis. I think most people in the media side felt it would be, yet he was uh, dismissive of the dangers of fighting you. Do you think he underestimated you going into this rematch after the first encounter you two had? 
I think so because I think that I think that they, as a team, his coaches and himself, dismissed the fact that I broke my hand in the first round, and that changed a lot of the grappling that was involved in that first fight. And in a way, it took away almost all the grappling ability I had. And he may have thought that that was an easy fight or whatever it was, but regardless of the outcome of that fight, that was a year and a half ago, and I was injured the entire fight. And whatever they wanted to say or do, and, uh, you know, I heard a couple things in the media that they, you know, the fight wouldn't have been any different if my hand wasn't broke and this and that. And so I wanted to make it a point that the fight would have been very different if my hand wasn't broke. And that's kind of why I rode him like a dog the entire fight. Mm -hmm. I mean, you mentioned in interviews how you wanted the chance to face him again. You know, why were you so interested in that rematch? Was it simply to show, like you mentioned, the hand thing? And how satisfying was it to beat him in arguably the biggest fight of both of your careers? Um, it was definitely, it was more the fact that they dismissed the, you know, the, um, the importance of me needing both hands to be able to grapple him. Mm. And obviously anybody can defend takedowns if you're only shooting with one hand and you're only able to use one hand and the striking is different. And it was my power hand, my left hand, which I can land some big shots with that left hand. Whether or not my striking is sloppy or not sharp or whatever people like to say, I can land some heavy shots and change a fight with that. I landed a left overhand against Siler last year and dropped him in the first round. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it changes fights when you don't have all your tools. And regardless of pushing through it and adversity and this and that, it changed the, the outcome of the fight, in my opinion. And I pushed through five rounds, and, and I, I didn't take anything away from him. I congratulated him and his team on beating me and taking the belt. And, you know, I had no... I had no problem with accepting that loss, but I knew that wasn't me 100%, and that's that's the main reason I wanted to get that one back. Now, I asked several fighters before the playoffs if they felt an added pressure, and they all said no. It was all the you know, same kind of pressure and stuff like that. Now, um, I ever asked Josh Copeland and Sean O'Connell in the last week the same thing. Now that you're in the, the finals, so close to getting a million dollars, is there now a different feel of pressure because of how huge the moment is and how much of an effect on it is not only on your career, but your life to have be in this million dollar fight. Um, I don't think so. I mean, I know the, the, everybody thinks of the money and obviously the money is great, but, um, I got here, I got to this point you know, I've made more money already this year than I've made my entire life just because I've been active. And I haven't had the opportunity to be as active because I was the champ in World Series for so long and I would only fight like twice a year. Mm -hmm. And then there were two fights in a row where I broke my hand and had eight-month layoffs in between. And just to be this active this year and have the success that I've had and not have any injuries in any fights and be able to continue and get to this point Honestly, in my honest opinion, the only thing holding me back from winning the million dollars this year was getting injured in a fight and not being able to continue. And that was what I was worried about more than any of the opponents I've ever faced. And that's the only thing that's caused me to lose any of the fights that I've lost in the last two years was being injured in the fight and taking away from the ability that I have. So to me, it wasn't it wasn't anything about money or whatever the – the, at, is at the end of the road when it comes to this final fight. It's more of winning this belt and putting another belt in my belt case and being the best that I can be and going out there and putting on a five-round war and putting on a show now that we're at the end of it where the first two fights of the tournament with the quarters and semis were get through without any injuries, get to the next one. Then against Harrison, it was go out there and beat this guy and win this fight definitively where nobody can say that mm -hmm. I squeaked by or did what I, you know, did whatever and barely won. I mean, I dominated him on top for two rounds. They gave him the first round, which was okay. It was back and forth on our feet. We both kind of felt each other out, whatever. But for those last two rounds, I dominated on top. I landed some ground and pound. He had zero chance of escaping in either of those two rounds. So I consider that a dominant win. And that was that to me was something that was more 
that was more than making the finals. That was just more. It wasn't even revenge. It was just more showing that I was that I was much better fighter than what I showed when I fought him in March of 2017. Uh, and getting to the finals and whoever it was going to be, whether it was going to be Alexander Almeida, who I've already spent 50 minutes in a cage with, mm-hmm. or Steven Seiler, who I've spent 15 minutes in a cage with, and I know very well personally. Um, it's To me, it's just another fight, and it's a title fight, and I look at it as a title fight uh, for a belt, for the chance to become the first featherweight PFL champion. Um uh, that's basically what it is. I mean, the money is the money is what it is, but it's really. I always break it down to make it less of something that should cause pressure. So mm-hmm. when everybody looks at it as a million dollar fight, to me, it's only a nine hundred thousand dollar fight because mm-hmm. we got paid a hundred thousand for the quarters and semis, mm-hmm. and nine hundred thousand after taxes is only six hundred thousand. After you pay your coaches, is maybe a half a million. Um, when I break it down, I really look at it as a million dollars isn't a lot of money in 2018. Mm-hmm. It's nice. It changes. It can change your life for a short period of time, or it could help someone buy a home, help somebody pay off some debt, whatever it may be, but it's not something that you can live the rest of your life off of. So after December 31st, we move on to 2019, and there's another season ahead, or there's another opportunity ahead. So I just look at it as another opportunity to go out and perform and put on a great 25 minutes if that's what it takes. If I can get the finish before then, then I'll look for that. But I'm always going to be looking for the finish. I mean, speaking of 2019, I mean, you've been a stalwart of World Series of Fighting and then into its transition into the PFL since 2013. If you win, win or lose, honestly, because you've done so much with World Series of Fighting, being a champion there, is there a desire to you know seek out the next challenge in another promotion or – the money is good, and you have made as much as you have and you, as ever in this year. You want to come back for a second season and make a bunch more. Yeah, I think it's one of those things that I'll have to sit down and. Well, obviously, I plan on winning the winning the the finals. I don't ever go into a fight planning on what if I lose, what if I this. Mm. So I never plan for the backup plan. But um, when you win, you're automatically in for the next year. So that's part of the contract mm. anyways. So, but the money, the money is great. And winning this season would mean I could renegotiate the contracts for the first two fights of next year. Hmm. And I think that's something that's very important too, because I've already made a lot of money this year yeah. with the fights that I've had because it's my contract. Um, my contract was really good based off of being with World Series for so long and being the champ there before it was PFL. And um, there's a lot of variables that go into that. But um, but that's, you know, that's not until January when I'm really going to think about that, honestly. I think it's right now it's just tunnel vision to, to fight Steven Tyler again and, you know, put on a great show on New Year's Eve. I know there's going to be a lot of my friends, family, fans, business partners, a lot of people that, that – I consider my family are going to be there and um, I just want to be able to celebrate that with them and be able to enjoy my time out in New York. And our first fights were in New York city at Hulu theater and our final fight's going to be at the same exact place. Mm-hmm. So I'm really excited for that more than anything to, to kind of end this cycle where it started this year. It is, uh, is like, you know, is this the to to win this? I mean, you've won the the World Series of Fighting Championship. You've won state wrestling titles, Big Ten title. Is this the biggest achievement of your career? If you win, um, financially, yes. Um, as far as as far as in my life, I wouldn't say it is. But I guess if you tie the financial side of it to it than it is but um you know being in the ncaa finals being a four-time all-american in wrestling being a big 10 champion and beating one of the guys who i had trouble beating my entire college career at the big 10 finals um all that stuff is stuff that will never i don't think anything will ever be that unless i win maybe maybe a UFC title or something like that. I I think just because the prestige of a UFC title was so high when I came in this sport, I think that's kind of the, the cherry on top overall over everything else. But 
at this time, I mean, I'm focused on just going out there and getting this belt and winning this season. But honestly, my wrestling career is something that I cherish a lot, and I don't think anything will surpass that, no matter how much money I make. I think I think I, I had so much fun competing for a team and competing in college, and wrestling was a sport that I loved and I still love, and I still – Every day that I've been home in Columbus, Ohio, I've been teaching kids and doing private lessons with uh, with older jujitsu guys that are in the area and, and kids. I've had at least one private lesson every day that I've been home, and that's something that that I like to do is spread the knowledge that I have of wrestling. And um, no matter how much money I make, I, I doubt I'll ever get away from wrestling, regardless of where the sport of MMA takes me. I mean, you were you like I mentioned before. You you work with World Series of Fights since 2013. Now you're PFL. What has been your experience in this new version of the company with PFL compared to your time with World Series of Fighting? Um, it's been the same experience with the the people that work there because they're all the employees and and Carlos and uh, and Ray Seppo. They've been they've been here since world series. So I feel like I have such a bond with them because I've been around them so long. Um, and they're great people. They take care of me. They're, you know, they do what they can. They, they take care of my family, my family members. They, you know, put them right up close to the cage when I fight. And, uh, you know, it is a family. It's a relationship that I have, have had with them since 2013. And it's something that, uh, that I would hope they take just as serious as I do. So, you know, from that aspect of it, there it's nothing really different from what it was before. The only difference with the PFL season is that I've been way more active, and that's something that I really like. Um, having two fights a year wasn't really something I was happy with with World Series, and to be able to have four fights already going on five within the same calendar year, that's something that's pretty cool to me. Now, Andre Harrison felt he was the best featherweight in the world when I interviewed him. Now, you beat him. If you then win this championship, are you the best featherweight in the world? Every day when I go into training, I believe that I'm the best featherweight in the world. And there are just times, there's just hasn't been that time where I've been able to show that on a big stage or on a stage that gets, a lot of media attention or what have you. So I felt that I've been the best featherweight for a long time. And I just haven't had the opportunity to show it against who the media considers are the top five or top 10 featherweights in the world. Uh, So, I mean, beating Steven Tyler for the second time and winning this PFL season, I hope it would put me somewhere up there, but I feel that the media doesn't give PFL the credit that the competition and the athletes deserve in a way. Um, And it's no, it's really no media in particular. It's just in general, I guess. I feel like we're the, we're like the third or fourth on the, you know, on the scale of Mm -hmm. the best organization down. And I feel like we have better athletes than what we get credit for in, in our organization. And, in the league so i don't know i think it's just more of a it's more of an opinion thing you know i I feel that i've been the best for a long time and i feel like i've had fights where i haven't performed my best whether i've won or in the fights that i've lost or whatever it may be but i'm 16 and 3 going into this finals fight and winning this fight would put me at 17 and 3 it put me in my 20th pro fight it'd be It'd be a great accomplishment. It would put some nice money in the bank for me. Um, but with all with the trade that just went down between one and the UFC, mm-hmm. I think there's going to be a lot more things like that. And hopefully that brings a little more value to the athletes and I think a, hopefully a little more respect to the athletes because if somebody wants you bad enough, you know maybe they'll make a trade or someone somebody will pay to to have you in their organization or whatever it may be. But I think that was really big for our sport. And to see a guy like Demetrius Johnson, who has the most title defenses in UFC history and, you know, one of the best, regardless of the weight class, regardless of who he's fought. I mean, he fought the best 25ers in the, in the world Mm -hmm. over and over and over again and dominated and proved that he was the best and he didn't want to be in the UFC anymore. So I think that's, 
maybe that's all a wake up call as well. But fair weather fans or, you know, casual fans will never understand. They'll just see the they'll just see the organization that's on T V the most and that gets the most media attention and say that those guys are the best. And which honestly those guys are they're great competition but they get a lot of media push. Whereas you only see this year has been the most media attention I've ever gotten because I fought four times and PFL did a great job pushing this first season. Mm. So I think it's something that will only grow and get better. And I think PFL has picked up a lot of steam because when you win, you move on. It's not like a sixth or seventh ranked guy getting the next title shot because you can talk better than the three, four and five or something. Um, I don't know. There's just, there's a lot of things that could be said for the sport right now and where it's taken a turn toward entertainment more than sport. But um, I guess it, that's what sells their pay-per-views and that's the way they have to do it. But I, I just want to be the best in the sport, regardless of how well I could talk. I could easily talk crap and, and build up a fight and do whatever it takes. But if I'm not getting paid anymore to do that, what's the point of doing it? And I think that's how a lot of athletes feel.